So, you know, uh, 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 this talk is focusing on adaptive immunotherapy for neuroblastoma, and uh, I'm, I'm originally from Hungary, but, you know, I'm immigrated to the United States, and in, in Texas, what, what I noticed is that, you know, they're really proud of uh, that everything is bigger in Texas. So as you were driving in here, I was amazed how on these narrow roads no one is crashing into each other. In, uh, in Texas now we have uh, the Interstate 10, which has 26 lanes as, as you are passing over Beltway 8, and there are constantly uh, you know, traffic jams and accidents. And, and uh, so I'm not sure if uh, getting bigger is better. Um, certainly here one would start to think that maybe this is where we need to put in a speed, a, you know, speed train to um, you know, um, facilitate uh, public transport or something like that, but um, we can just add more lanes as well. <laughs> So, um, on the other hand, you know, get, you know, having a certain number or a more number of researchers together is certainly good for innovation and research. And the Texas Medical Center does provide a really unique opportunity for this. You know, right now there is, um, we, we are located with, at Texas Children's here and in the Medical Center. And these, um, these are our buildings. And one of them right here, this tall one, is the Feynman Center but that is solely dedicated for research. And there are some administrative uh, buildings there. But in this medical center, there are 49 institutions now, 7,000 patient beds, and um, over, a, over a, a million patient visit per year. So it's really a phenomenal place to, to do research with, uh, with a, a, a number of uh, physician scientists there as well. Um, Texas Children's Cancer Center has 73,000 patient visits per year, and we have 500 children, unfortunately, who have, are diagnosed with uh, cancer. We have 200 active clinical trials, and, and, and we have 140 physicians and scientists who run these clinical trials and, and also do preclinical pre -clinical work. Uh, as Daniel alluded to, to do cell therapy-based clinical trials, we really need unique facilities. It's not just that you need to have basic and transitional laboratories, but the main thing is to have a GMP facility where you can make the viruses to genetically modify T cells and um, um, and test your TSA product at the end to, for release for patients. I mean, you don't want to infuse something that's infected or that has a leukemic transformation, for example. So we, are, we have uh, 21 CAR TSA trials, over 200 patients infused, and over 300 patients infused with, uh, with uh, um, antigen-specific T cells already. So how does adaptive immunotherapy work? And, and Daniel had a fantastic review already on this, so I'm just going to go really briefly. As you know, there are various blood cells, and we are focused on Y blood cells, and, in, in, in sp and specifically on lymphocytes. And there are various lymphocyte subsets that you can go further into. The current work that we are going to be talking about is on T cells. You can do similar investigation in natural killer cells, and now we know that natural killer T cells, which are not natural killer cells and not T cells, just to make everyone even more confused, they are also very important for neuroblastoma. So, you know, as you've seen, what the key thing with adaptive immunotherapy that for every single patient, you drop blood from them, you genetically modify those T cells or NK cells or NK T cells or gamma delta T cells, and then you reinfuse the, the, the product into the patient, and then you see whether this is safe, whether, and, and whether the, the approach is effective. You can, you can generate tumor-specific T cells in various ways. You, you heard about just a minute ago about CAR T cells. You can expand tumor-specific T cells by actually stimulating the T cells uh, from the patient by antigens um, that can be expressed on the, on the tumors as well. So one, one of these approaches that we just started recently is uh, the trial's name is Tactosome, and it's expanding tumor-associated antigen-specific T cells. And here you can see that we are using a, a number of tumor-associated antigens to create a T cell product that hopefully can go after the tumor. So you already heard a little bit about CAR T cells, just to go back on how to generate CAR T cells. So we take a, a, a monoclonal antibody that can be specific to any antigen, 
and we fuse it with the T cell receptor. And that generates this chimeric antigen receptor. There are a very number of um, generations that, that you can use. And first, I'm just going to talk about the first generation of chimeric antigen receptor that was uh, tested uh, a number of years ago, and the results are already published. The study's name was Nestle's, and it was testing two cellular products in the same patient. Um, one, one, one T cell product was just activated T cells genetically engineered to express a GD2 card. And the other T cell product was um <coughs> bar virus specific T cells engineered to express a GD2 card. And the idea behind this was that those patients who have Epstein Barr virus infection, and most of us in this room probably have gone through that, the T cells will not only get support for survival and expansion when they are seeing the tumor, which the tumor itself is a very hostile environment for the T cells, but they will also get continuous stimulation from the low level of Epstein Barr virus infection that is unfortunately persisting in, in most of us here in this room as well. So the, the, the question was, are the T cell product with the Epstein Barr virus background, is that going to be resulting in a better expansion and a better outcome for, for patients? <coughs> there were two cohorts in this patient, one in, in this trial, one that was uh, enrolling patients who did have uh, evaluable disease, and the second cohort was those patients who are in remission, but obviously these patients had relapsed refractory neuroblastoma and went into remission. So it was a high risk uh, group for re disease recurrence. So 19 patients were treated all together, and 11 patients were enrolled on the active disease arm. And out of those 11 patients, three patients had uh, sustainable complete remissions. Um, two had uh, tumor necrosis, one had partial response, one had stable disease, and unfortunately still had four of them had progressive disease. When we looked at, you know, is this working for soft tissue disease, is this working for bony disease, it seemed like um, that they, are work, they worked for, for everything. And here, the, this picture just demonstrates that, I'm not sure how the project's there, but if you can see, there is a little soft tissue kind of outgrowth from the bone in this patient's uh, scan, and that goes away after a single T-cell infusion. And this patient remains in complete remission after uh, many, many years. The next, the role of co-stimulation. Um, this is where we were trying to figure out, is the Epstein-Barr virus backbone better than just using the first generation CAR itself? And what you can see here is, by looking at T-cell persistence over time, is that if your CAR was expressed in Epstein virus specific CTLs, which are getting continu continuous you know, stimulation and support um, for, for persistence, the persistence and expansion was significantly better. What's even more important that if you look at patients whose CAR T cells persisted for longer than six weeks versus those whose T cells didn't persist, Obviously, the outcome was much significantly better for those um, where, where the T cells did persist. Now. So the next is third generation CAR, and in this case, this is our current study that is now closed. And and with the third generation CAR, we wanted to um, kind of uh, recapitulate the Epstein Barr virus backbone. We didn't want to restrict this therapy to patients who have been exposed to Epstein Barr virus because as we age, the more and more of us will get this viral infection and, and then we'll have the virus persisting in us. But children with high risk neuroblastoma are young, so a two year old, three year old may not have this virus. So it, it, it you know, restricted the number of patients who would be eligible for this study. And there are several studies now, and even when this trial was in planning phases, um, that showed that including costimatory endodomains in the chimeric antigen receptor design 
and there are a very number of them. Then you have to four one PB. In this car, we use OX40 and CD28. These are just numbers. These are just you know names for molecules. But what we know is that when you are including these co-stimulatory endodomies into the car, the, the T cells, at least in the preclinical models, persist better. They kill the tumors better. And, and so obviously the question was, will that happen in, in, in patients as well? So GRAIN opened in uh, 2013. And I think uh, several of you already mentioned you know, how long things take. So the preclinical uh, results were published in 2005. So it took eight years to get from the preclinical publication to treating the first patient, which is something that we really need to calm down. Obviously, during those eight years, a number of studies come out. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of things that why we, as we were moving forward with the study, we had to change it numerous times because of newer and newer publications. And that's going to be a critical as we are moving forward with cell therapy studies. And so, as far as eligibility for this trial, evaluable disease was one of the key parts. So we only treated patients who had relapsed refractory neuroblastoma and still had disease. Um, there is an, uh, a safety switch in, uh, in this construct, the inducible caspase 9, which at the end, due to licensing issues, uh, the company who owns the patent for it did not um, grant the approval to use it. But fortunately, we didn't have severe toxicity, so we didn't have to use it. So the first cohort of patients um, were treated on this frozen arm. In that case, patients were treated, infused with uh, um, um, T cells after a freezing step. And the T cells were expanded with IL-2 in, in the GMP facility. And at week six, we looked at response to therapy. And, and obviously, that's a big problem because we know that if they don't expand and don't persist, that's not, not going to be resulting in, in better outcomes. So we amended the trial and opened up the FRESH cohort. And it's, called, it's FRESH because there are three distinct changes that we did with the clinical trial. One, that we included lymphodepletion with cyclophosphamide food therapy. We also started to manufacture the cells with IL-7 and IL-15 in the, in the uh, GMP. And I know that there's a lot of question about IL-2's utility in the context of the antibody um, trial. This is a little bit different, but we had pretty significant evidence that um, IL-2 is not the best way to expand these T cells. And we also took out the freezing step, so we were infusing T cells after um, after manufacturing directly from the plate, directly from the from the lab, and then you know, we, we still didn't have as good of an anti-tumor effect as we wanted to, and at the same time in the laboratory we were trying to figure out what's happening, and we realized that with the third generation car, this car is very active and it produces a lot of interferon gamma, but interferon gamma itself then triggers a response in neuroblastoma cells, and neuroblastoma cells upregulate that PDL1 uh, um, molecule, which you, you guys already heard, is a very important checkpoint inhibitor, uh, checkpoint molecule, that can actually block the T cells as they get to the tumor site. The use of a PD1 inhibitor that blocks this inhibition from the neuroblastoma uh, <coughs> is the use of pembrolizumab. And in addition to lymphodepletion, we also gave a dose of pembrolizumab on day minus one and on day 21 to patients. And then we, we continued with response evaluations. But the good and the bad thing is that there was a breakthrough study that came out this summer from a group from the, uh, of the NIH. And this just goes, again, to, to the, the, the exhaustion of T cells and, and, and some of the things that are important for, for uh, checkpoint inhibition as well. So here, if you look at the T cells, even when they don't see neuroblastoma, except for the currently highly active CD19 car, where 91% of patients, relapsed refractory leukemia patients, will have complete, remission, complete responses after a single dose. If you look at the GB2 car, it upregulates, without even being exposed to the tumors, it upregulates all these exhaustion markers. 
And what happens is that these chimeric antigen receptors, due to the nature of the uh, antigen binding part of the receptor that's derived from an antibody, actually they, they can form these clusters on the cell, which when you look at the antibody, for the antibody's purposes, it's a good thing. That's how they have these clusters on the cells, on the tumor cells when you use the antibody. But when it's in the context of the chimeric antigen receptor, this is not good. Because when these clusters are formed here on the GD2 car, and they are not formed on the CD19 car, it's nicely distributed, they start to trigger through without even seeing the, the tumor cells. And that can actually exhaust the T cells. So, um, and this, this, is, this was you know, a breakthrough study and obviously provided a lot of explanation to, to why, in general, in solid tumors, we are not seeing that much uh, improvement. Um, if you look at not just neuroblastoma, but in the sarcoma bird or, or in the brain tumor bird, the responses are way behind than what we see in CD19 in CAR, so for lymphoma uh, lymphoma patients. And I think this might be the key to explain this. So the conclusion from our trials are um, that targeting GD2 can result in, in concrete remissions. Lymphodepletion and manufacturing does improve the persistence, and we now are switching to you to incorporate that in, in all our trials. Adoptive trial design is going to be really critical for running these biological trials in the future. You know, when you, when you wait so long to roll out a study to treat patients from the preclinical data um, being published to actually the first patient to treat it, and then these trials then run a couple of years while, we, while you are recruiting patients and monitor toxicity, during those time periods there will be new and new results coming up, and you can't you just can't ignore it. So working together with the regulatory board, um, regulatory agencies, is going to be more and more you know, important moving forward. And I know that this is a big issue now in the UK. I, I'm not sure that it's, it's um, not a problem in the US, but, but perhaps the responsiveness of the FDA has been um, really favorable, at least during this, this study, um, approving the 11 amendments to the to this study that it went through to its current state, and um, yeah, and so the future direction is uh, that obviously you know now that we know what what's important for these cars, we need to submit a new IND and um, and open the, a new study for enrollment, and a new and then the next generation of GD2 car is now. Um, I would say picked finally in the laboratory. There's a PhD student who thinks that there's always one more thing that can be done to make it even better. Um, so I told him that no pressure, but there are a lot of people waiting for this. So at some point, you just have to move forward. Um, but with that, I just want to acknowledge, you know, a lot of uh, people who help with this. And first and foremost, you know, patients and families. Without your support and without your faith in these novel approaches, and I'm not just talking for CAR T cell therapy, but just in general, whether it's precision medicine, molecular guided therapy, you know, this would not be possible. So thank you for you know, being engaged with us and coming and, uh, and, and supporting all the investigations that are out there. And there are a ton of people who work on these um, CAR T cell therapies in the laboratory who are not visible to you, but those are the ones who actually work in the lab, um, expanding the T-cells for the patients. And you know, Helen Hassel, Leo Rooney, and Marco Brenner are fantastic um, at Center for Cell and Gene Therapy. And then you know, without, without the funding support, including the son of kids' cancer, this trial would not have been possible. And thank you very much. <laughs>